great to be here. And we just love being with you guys and look out and see your faces and stuff. And because we know each other, there's a different kind of thing. Like when I come into some place and I don't know anybody, there's all kind of... <laughs> you know, for, a, for quite a while, while they're kind of figuring out, do we like you? <laughs> um, but I come here and, and it's just a different feel already right from the start. Love it. <laughs> and um, Noel, we'll be praying for you too, you and Christy. <laughs> And Bill, thanks for being here. Um, thank you for, you know, let me echo what, what um, Josh said already. You know, that um, thank you for following where God has called you guys. Um, but then thank you for being here. I mean, just your, your presence, your, you and your family here um, is a ministry to us all. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm a professor. And so... Um, I love the space of time. There's two times a year I love the most. One, uh, one is, uh, as, as a professor, one is when um, the year begins and there's all the promise, there's new students coming in, there's new courses, and we yes! And, and one is when it's over. <laughs> <laughs> because you're just wrung out, you know? And as, as those of you who are students, you've got the same feel with things, okay? And so we're kind of in that zone now where we're in between that. And yet I see it coming, uh, the next uh, term showing up on, on us here. And, and one of the things that's coming up is a course in which uh, I do this each year for this course. Uh, the students are required to read, among other things, a biography. And they can choose any biography they want. I mean, it has to be about... Uh, someone who's a believer, a follower of Jesus. Uh, the only other requirement is the person has to be dead. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is I want them to have the whole story, not just a clip. I want them to be able to see the whole thing from beginning to end, how God was at work in this person. And the students, you know, they'll often pick someone who's one of, one of their favorites, you know, someone that they admire, and now here's a chance for them to read a biography on this, this man or woman who God has used. And, and it, when I do this with them, there is a, um, a specific, you know, reason for this. I'm wanting them to approach the biographer as a researcher. And I want them to, to read it in a way that they look in behind the scenes and find out what was going on in the background of this person. What was going on in the spiritual life of this person that made this happen? Uh, what was... What was this individual, this man or woman, doing in cultivating their relationship with God that allowed this to take place? So that they would actually write a biography on this person. Now, here's the thing. Whenever I have the students share with everybody what they found, there are a whole bunch of different things that come out. I mean, there's, there's uh, uh, how they spent time in the Word and the people they surrounded themselves with and all this kind of, there's all sorts of these things and we write them all on the whiteboard that's all over the place here. But there's one thing and only one thing that is consistent with every single one of them. One thing that stands out above the top of all the rest of them as far as a characteristic of the spiritual life of a man or a woman that God has used greatly in the kingdom. Prayer. Every single one of these individuals, when you get in behind the scene, if God has used them greatly in the kingdom, you will find that this person was a person of prayer. That's the common feature among all of them. And it's, it's one of those things, too, that whenever the assignment is, is carried out, we're all kind of sorting it out, you almost see the little light bulbs come on. Beep, 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 over everybody's head. They go, ah. You know, I get it again, you know, that this is huge, that prayer is something that is a non-negotiable baseline feature if God is going to um, do something great with your life, if God is going to, to somehow um, produce something in you and make you a certain kind of person. This is going to be something that is absolutely essential there. Now, having said that, some of you already have a sinking feeling inside you <laughs> because you're thinking to yourself, oh, my prayer life is so feeble. Huh? I mean, in fact, whenever I ask people, if I was to do this now, I won't do this. Okay, just keep us straight. You know, 
No signals. Okay. But if I was to, to ask you this morning um, to, to kind of rate your prayer life, you know, like from, let's just say, 1 to 10, and 10 being the high, we'd probably have nobody a 10 except somebody who's very, um, you know, arrogant and all that kind of, I mean, <laughs> we'd have other problems with that person here, but probably not too many up here. We probably would find very few with the eight and the, you know, the nine and the eight and stuff. And probably we'd all start to fall in line somewhere in the middle here, and some would trail off all the way down here to the, the one or twos type of thing here. But that's one of the things we, we're always struggling with. We're wrestling with this idea of, of our prayer lives. That, that somehow it's, it's falling short and we wish there was more. And so we read books about it. And we we uh, hopefully have classes on it and sermons on it and all this kind of stuff to somehow address this issue of prayer in our lives. Well, that's what I'm hoping that we will do this week and the next two weeks afterward is to focus on prayer, but to do so in a way that perhaps is a bit different. We're going to look at what is perhaps the most well-known prayer in all the scriptures. The prayer that is simply known as the Lord's Prayer. Now, I have to be very honest okay, at this point. Okay, I'll let you know. This has been my study for the last few months. And it launched because prior to that, I started looking at this and 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 realizing this is the one time where Jesus actually teaches very specifically how to pray. It's not like giving ideas or concepts about prayer or anything like that, but where he actually sits it down and says, look, here's the framework, here's how you do it. And realizing that in my life, I have never taken that seriously. This has been one of those, I, I know it's there, I can quote it to you, I can tell you the framework on it, I can tell you all sorts of stuff about it, all this kind of stuff, but as far as something that was incorporated into my life as my actual framework for prayer, honest moment, it wasn't there. And so I decided I would take this seriously. And I started diving deeper and deeper into this and discovering that it has transformed how I pray. It's become kind of bedrock for me now on what prayer is all about. Now, here's the thing. As we look into this over these next few weeks, um, that uh, what we're going to find is that Jesus does not offer us um, some insights on how to become more effective in your prayer life. If you look at the Lord's Prayer, there's nothing in there on that. It's not like, okay, here's six ways to become more effective or more powerful. Not there. He does not offer us um, <coughs> any insights on how to make your prayer life really come alive. And that's what I mean. In fact, when you read the Lord's Prayer, uh, which we'll do next week, we're going to do it all together, so get ready. You'll see some people start to yawn when we do it. Okay, because there's nothing... Powerful. It doesn't do that to us. In fact, we're not going to find that Jesus gives us somehow in this, this prayer here some hidden secrets on how to make your prayer life truly dynamic. To kind of sneak in there and get an inside track on God. It's not there. In fact, we're going to find that, it's, that it almost moves us to an, well, not almost, it moves us to an entirely different place. I mean, if it does in you what it has done in me, it relocates how you pray, reframes how we pray, uh, reorients us in how we pray. So now, with that thought in mind, I'd like to take this morning and have us actually kind of set it up a bit because it requires a bit of setting up before we dive into the heart of the prayer. And to do that, I want us to actually look at how Jesus prayed. Not in great depth, because we don't have the time to do that, but we start there, and we look into Jesus' life. In fact, I'm, I'm convinced, if you read through the Gospels and, and you uh, track Jesus concerning um, the issue of prayer in his life, that you come away with, with an interesting insight into it 
that if you want a reason why to pray, I mean, if you're one of those that's wrestling with, why should I do this? The most compelling reason why to pray is because Jesus did. You find it pervasive in his life. And if Jesus had this at, as such a priority, as such a core feature in him, it is a compelling reason for us to have the same kind of thing in our life, for prayer to be what is central and woven into every aspect of our life. Now, here's, here's a couple of interesting places as you look at the scriptures. We see a consistent pattern happening in Jesus' life. And there's, we could go to a bunch of them, but let me just give you a couple here this morning. One would be in, in Mark uh, chapter 1, and we'll look basically at verse 35 here. But Mark chapter 1 is one of those, those places where <coughs> uh, there has just been some, uh, you know, really powerful things happening in uh, Capernaum, which is at the northern part of, of Galilee there. And there's been healings and demons cast out. I mean, there's just all this kind of stuff going on. And it's almost like a, a spiritual dust that starts to settle afterward after all this has been happening here. And then you come across this, verse 35. Uh, right after all this happened here, it says, early in the morning, this is the next day, early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went out to a secluded place and was praying there. Now, this is, this is a pattern, by the way. Okay, this is just one of the places it shows up. But here there's been this big deal here. Next day, early in the morning, I, in fact, I, you know, I've kind of looked at this a bit here, and I don't think any of the disciples were morning people. You know, take, take heart in that because, <laughs> because usually Jesus is up and, and out doing stuff while these guys are still snoring away. But anyway, early in the morning, it's still dark. Jesus goes away as really kind of a pattern in his life and has this time in what is called a secluded place, uh, a place that is away from everybody where he is alone with God, with, with his father <coughs> and, and prays there. Then notice what happens. Uh, verse 36. Simon and his companions searched for him. <laughs> Which to me adds a little bit of comedy. Because it's almost like every morning, one of the jobs that the disciples had was to find Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's like, they finally all get up, you know, and they're, the day is getting underway here, and they say, okay, whose job is it today to go find Jesus? Okay, Simon, you're on today. Okay, tomorrow it's Matthew and whatever. Like, okay. but, but they go out and they have to go find him out there. He's off somewhere praying. And it was a pattern that, that just became part of what was just the way it was. And in verse um, 37 there, it says, and they found him. And they said, hey, everybody's looking for you. You know, where are you? Let's get on with things here. Huh. So that, you know, and you would find this as you read through the Gospels over and over again. This is, this is a piece of it, as Jesus is always out doing this. So one more place to look at quickly here. Um, Luke chapter 5, um, verse 16. Um, this is again after a lot of you know, crowds and healings and all this kind of stuff, a lot of flurry of activity spiritually. And it says, but Jesus himself would often slip away into the wilderness or into those desolate places, those deserted places, and pray. This is a pattern in his life that in the midst of things, all that's going on, he takes time and moves away to where he can be alone with the Father and pray. This was something that was essential for him in life on this planet as he took on human form and lived among us. If it was crucial for him, that's a compelling reason it must be crucial for us. In fact, as you look through his life, several things to notice on this. One is that if you read through the Gospels, you find that, that as a pattern in his life, a daily practice, that Jesus finds some time to move away from everything and be alone with the Father. As a consistent daily practice practice. Secondly, you'd notice that um, 
before any major decision is made, Jesus always takes a significant time to be alone in prayer. I mean, a significant time. An example being, before he chooses the 12 disciples, he spends um, an entire night in prayer just getting himself synced with the Father before he does this. Uh, a pattern that is happening there before any major decision. Another thing to notice is that before and after any major activity in his life, Jesus is in significant prayer. Now, we would expect it before. You know, there's some big deal coming up. We're going to go into the city here, and we're expecting that there'll be healings to happen and, you know, spiritual warfare going on and all this kind of stuff. We would expect you to kind of gear up for that. We do that. What is fascinating to me is that Jesus spends as much or more time afterward in prayer, going away and being alone, because perhaps that's where the greatest attack comes. Perhaps that's where the greatest battles happen is in the aftermath. Uh, so you look at Jesus' life, and if you want a, a compelling reason to pray, you see it in his life as someone who was totally absorbed in this and wove it into every single aspect of his life. But not only do you see it in the pattern of his prayer, but you see it in um, the very themes of his prayer. Every once in a while, we get an insight into how he prays, and there'll be a little clip or perhaps a longer portion of it when um, you see what he's praying about and little, little pieces into this thing. In fact, I've wondered about this thing. Uh, if, um, you know, if, if when the disciples went out to find him, like in the morning, they get that Capernaum type of thing, they go out looking for him. Let's say, um, you know, that you were the one that went out that morning and you had to go find him. Okay, that was your job. Okay, you're going to go find Jesus. And you come across him and he's praying. What do you think he would be praying about? What would you hear? Wouldn't that be a fascinating thing to actually be hearing Jesus pray? You know, I mean, you, you come up on him and, he's, and you hear him praying out there and see, so you kind of, you know, I, I don't want to interrupt this. <laughs> I might disturb the whole universe, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to be very careful on approaching Jesus while he's praying. But while, you, while you're waiting, you're kind of there and you're waiting and you listen a little bit. I mean, I would do that. I mean, I'd probably, huh, wow, you know, and hear how Jesus is speaking with his father during all this. Now, can you also imagine, now, what, what's your name? Nathan. Nathan? Let's imagine that it's Nathan's time to go find Jesus. And as, as you come up on him, you hear this. And Father, Nathan. <laughs> now, suddenly, you perk, right? Now, and hopefully you hear um, Nathan and not Nathan. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> but wouldn't that be fascinating too to come upon him and to hear how he's praying for you? Um, very fascinating. I've, I've thought of that. My imagination kind of rolls with that, you know, and I, and I kind of picture what that must be like. And I, I hopefully I always hear Steve. <laughs> 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 uh, but sometimes I think I hear the other. Um, <laughs> but, but as they would come on, there's a consistent theme also, not a pattern, not only a pattern of Jesus praying all the time, but there's a consistent theme in what they would hear. Because anytime we get insight into Jesus praying, he's always praying about uh, the Father's glory, and he's always praying about kingdom goals, and he's praying about this larger redemptive plan. He's always praying into something bigger out there. Very seldom that you ever find him somehow even getting close to the, the granular things that we often pray about. Instead, it's big stuff and bringing everything into this larger picture here. Uh, if you want insight into to prayer, just track Jesus' life through the Gospels. The disciples did. 
I mean, they're watching this thing. Like we talked about, they're, they're seeing him pray all the time. I mean, every time they turn around, he's praying again. Before anything that's going on, feeding the 5,000, whatever you want to do. Okay, he's always, he's praying. And they come across him and they hear him and they see and they realize, you know, they start to put the things together, kind of like my students with the biographies. And they go, of course, this is key. And so you get down to um, Luke 11, verse 1. And you find one of the representatives of the disciples. Okay, it says, and, and one of them came kind of on behalf of the rest. And says, Jesus would you teach us how to pray? Now, it's not surprising the request would come. They've been watching this happen over and over and over again. They see it. They're making the connections. And they come to Jesus. Would you teach us to pray? Something to notice about this. This is the only recorded time where the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach, uh, teach them anything. They never say, would you teach us how to walk on that water thing? You know, they never, you know, they never ask him to, uh, to teach them anything else. But they, this one, they get it. They say, Will you teach us how to pray? And he does. What does he give them? Lord's Prayer. He says, here it is, guys. Now, what is interesting to me, okay, Luke 11 happens in the last few weeks of Jesus' earthly ministry. Last few weeks. But this wasn't the first time that this prayer is announced. Instead, it first comes out in the first few weeks of his ministry. All the way back in Matthew chapter 6. And that's where we go. Okay? So Matthew 6, find your way there. You're saying, you mean that was the whole introduction? <laughs> Well, kind of, we're framing it. We're just kind of, we're moving ourselves into this thing here. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 is where it first shows up. And it's in the middle of what we, we know as the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, which is chapters, M Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's, it's this long thing about the kingdom. It's where Jesus comes out and says, okay, look, here is the, here's the agenda. This is what kingdom life looks like. Here's where it's all moving. Here's Here's what's coming down the pike, but that we can experience it now. And in the middle of this, almost dead center in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls attention to prayer. And this is where the Lord's Prayer first shows up. Um, beginning of the ministry. Uh, so you're all there, I'm assuming. And so Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to look at some verses that lead us into this here. Uh, so you start uh, in verse 5. It says, when you pray, uh, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. So as we get into these verses that lead us into the Lord's Prayer, we're going to find there are two cautions that Jesus gives. The first one is this one. Two times where he says, look, here's how not to pray. And the first one he calls attention to is these, these hypocrites here, uh, the ones who are looking spiritual but not. Uh, and, uh, and basically he calls attention to the idea that prayer is not a performance. Prayer is not a performance. Here were the envisions. He's calling attention to these people who says they, they stand in the synagogue, or you might say in the church, uh, and on the street corners, and, and pray out loud so that everybody will see them. Now, to us, that seems odd, doesn't it? I mean, it's kind of like, who in the world would ever do that? Man, I, can't, I can't picture any of you doing that. I can't imagine anyone thinking that was a cool idea uh, to like stand up in the middle of a, a restaurant and go, excuse me, let me pray for us all, you know. Or to stand out on the street corner out here, or better yet, some other more busy street corner out here, and, and pray as loud as you can. I mean, somebody's going to haul you off if you do that. 
Now, it's not something we would say, well, yeah, I can see myself doing it. I'm glad you cautioned me not to. <laughs> but at the time that Jesus is speaking, this was a big deal. You know, think of Jewish mind at this time, at Jesus' time. And he's speaking of those that probably were some of the, um, the heroes of these people. You know, the spiritual, you know, um, icons of the time, you know, that they would think about, you know, there's, there's Rabbi so-and-so, and there's you know, this person, this person, who they had seen actually living out their spirituality, so to speak. They had heard them pray, They'd, you know, not, and they had it all down. And in their mind, they would picture this person as Jesus is talking, some, uh, probably a Pharisee, uh, and someone who is standing there and they're dressed just the right way, they're standing the right way, and, and they're praying, and it's not just that they're doing it in public, but they, the words they were using and how they said it, and they're picturing this and saying, oh, if I could only pray like that. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Um, prayer is not a performance. It's not getting it right somehow, having the right words to say, saying it the right way, being in the right position. None of, it's none of that. So, let, let me drop a story in here. By the way, Josh, when am I supposed to actually end? <laughs> you're, you're saying like two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to do this anyhow. This, this will be fast. Back here, you know, four or five years ago, I, I told you a story, but you, you don't remember that anyway. <laughs> Some of you weren't here then. But it, it's very appropriate to drop it in here today. True story. Um, this happened back in 1986. Uh, young man by the name of Jim. This is back in Michigan, small church, probably half the size of this. Okay. Uh, small church back there. And this church rallied up for this young guy, college-age guy, uh, to send him to Israel for the summer. Cool deal, right? I mean, who would, anybody not wanted it? Well, I anyway, okay. uh, somebody probably wouldn't want it. But, but this was his dream. They sent him there for the summer. They paid for everything. And so he goes there and uh, has a wonderful summer, comes back. He arrives back here on a Saturday. Uh, and uh, those of you who have done international travel for a long time, you know how that works. Because you arrive back but your mind and soul is still somewhere over the ocean. Um, and you're hoping it arrives at some point, right? Okay, everybody gets that? Okay, okay. So that's Jim. He's back on Saturday night, but he knows that he has to show up on Sunday morning. Because if he doesn't show up on Sunday morning, he's toast. Because here's a church that has paid for him and prayed for him all summer long. And if they hear he got back and then ditched church, so he rallies up, gets up, shows up on Sunday morning. Does like, like a lot of flash mob churches do. Um, he comes in at the last minute and sits in the last row. And he's hoping that somehow he can just get by this thing. But as soon as he sits down, the pastor notices him back there and says, Hey, Jim, you're back. Wonderful to see you again. Come on up to the front. And so they have him come up. And this is one of those churches where... You know, up in here, they had, like, the, the thrones, you know? Um, you know, big, cushy seats up here. And so the pastor has Jim come up and sit in one of these here and says, Jim, we just want, we want we've been praying for you all summer. We just want to look at you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so now Jim realizes, okay, I'm in a spot. Um, because now I have to look interested in the sermon um, and stay awake and all this kind of stuff. And so he's doing all the tricks, you know, to try and do that, you know, you know, you know biting his cheek and, you know, <sighs> taking deep breaths and all this kind of stuff. And he makes it, gets through the whole thing. And, and he's thinking, okay, I'm, I'm on my home run now. And, and then the pastor turns to him, uh, sermon's over and says, Jim, it's good to have you back here, but you know, it cost a lot of money to send you to Israel. A lot of money. And we've prayed for you. We've all got your picture on our refrigerator. 
And we thought that maybe this morning you could pay us back by closing our service in prayer in Hebrew. <laughs> that made sense. He's been in Israel all summer, right? I mean, gosh, the guy ought to know how to do that. Uh, but the problem with this was that Jim was on an archaeological dig all summer with Americans. And he had not learned hardly any Hebrew at all. I mean, in fact, most of the Hebrew he had learned he couldn't use in church. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so if he was together, if he was thinking right, he would have just, just said no. But remember, his mind is still somewhere else. And so in a moment of insanity, he says, sure. <laughs> and he gets up behind this big pulpit, strikes his most Jewish pose. <laughs> okay, that looks Jewish, doesn't it? <laughs> and he starts out. Abenu Bashamayim. Oh, it's a great start because that means our Father in Heaven. Okay. Abenu Bashamayim. Long pause. Ehad Shanayim Shalosha. That was just like this in the church. I mean, it's silent. <laughs> because they had just heard the heavenly language. Because everybody in, in heaven speaks Hebrew. <laughs> And yet nobody knew what he said. I mean, it was just kind of, you know, no, no one knew. In fact, the pastor didn't know because he didn't go to Western Seminary. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but who cares? You know, it's like, hey, it's Hebrew and stuff like that. So the pastor grabs him and says, Jim, it was worth every penny to send you there. <laughs> and so takes him out to the back. And, and it was one of those churches where everybody, you know, the pastor would stand at the back door. And afterward, everybody has to come by and lie to him about how good the sermon was. <laughs> and... <laughs> And so, so they're doing all that. But you know how God works. You, you know how God works, right? And, and so it just turned out that that Sunday morning, by chance, <laughs> there was visiting in that church a Jewish couple. <laughs> and they knew exactly what Jim had done. He had simply counted from one to ten. <laughs> And so they waited. <laughs> and they let everybody else go out, and then they got in line behind. And as they went through, the gentleman of the, the couple gets a hold of Jim's hand and shakes it, pulls him down close, and whispers in his ear, You know, Jim, a couple more weeks? 11, 12, 13. Okay. <laughs> 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 But it sounded spiritual. It looked spiritual. It had all the evidence of being spiritual, but it was empty, right? And that's the picture of this whole idea. Prayer is not a performance, he says. Don't do like these guys do. The other thing he cautions against is don't be like the Gentiles here. Um, down in verse... Um, verse 7. It says, don't be like the Gentiles, which the Gentiles uh, was... The terminology was used to describe anyone who was outside the, the, the commonwealth of Israel, anyone who was not part of the covenant family of the Jewish people here. So it was like an unbeliever. He says, don't be like them. He says that, that use meaningless repetition. Uh, the term that's there that's translated meaningless repetition in my Bible anyway is a term that means who are simply babblers, uh, who are speaking without thinking is literally the idea. Okay, they're talking without it makes no sense what they're saying here. And yet it says they, they put all sorts of words to it and they're trying to convince God, trying to somehow persuade him to give them what they want. He says, don't be like that. Don't be like these people. Your father knows what you need. Don't be like these people. Instead, and he gives us a different way of praying here. He um, says, instead... Pray this way. Now, there's two words to kind of get. We're going to get these words in very fast. Because remember, we've got two weeks to go. So I've, I've got plenty of time to work with this. 
But two words I want you to notice. First of all, he says, when you pray, um, pray in secret, verse 6. He says, don't, it's not a performance. Instead, he says, go into a, you know, uh, uh, a hidden place, a place, you know, a private place, and do this in secret. And the word secret there is not the idea of, I'm going to keep it from everybody. Nobody knows I do this. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> instead, it's, it's a word that's often used to describe the hidden person of the heart. It's a term that, that has the idea that, that you're not doing it so that anybody else can hear this, but you're doing it in a much more private, intimate way with you and God. Uh, something that, that sets us apart from everything. In fact, it says here that, that when you do this, uh, your father who is in secret, who is, in other words, the hidden person in the room, sees in this hidden way. The word that's used here, this is a fascinating thing to me. The word that's used here, there are a couple of words that the, the Greek Bible would use to, that would translate to see. And one is a word that, like, you see everything. But there's another word that has the idea of seeing something very specific, focused attention. It says your father who sees focused attention in private will respond to you. Isn't that cool? Ah, it's just there. The other one is to notice the word. Um, he says, uh, pray in this way. In other words, whenever he says, okay, not only is this going to be a, a something where we do this uh, in an intimate way between us and God, but we, we pray in a certain manner, a certain way of praying. Um, and then that sets us up for where he's going to go with this thing. There's a certain way of praying. Now, when he says that, he's not saying the prayer that he's going to give here is not something to memorize and simply quote over and over again. He's not giving us a mantra that if I say it enough times, that somehow I'll get points. Uh, he's not giving us... <coughs> You know, some kind of thing to simply incorporate in our, our worship services or something. Instead, what he gives us is what I've come to describe as kind of a, a pocket guide to prayer. And it's a genius thing. Remember, most of the people he's speaking to are illiterate. And so he gives them something very easy to memorize. You can read this thing in less than 30 seconds. That's if you're reading slowly. Uh, very easy to remember. And it allows us to somehow reorient ourselves to have a different way of framing how we actually approach our Father in prayer. And that's what we're going to look at over the next two weeks now. We're going to look at a prayer that actually breaks into two halves. The first half has to do with kingdom priorities. The second half has to do with kingdom practices. The first half has to do with us taking our life and all the mess and everything that's in it and dropping it into God's bigger picture. The second half invites God into our mess. Those are the two pieces of it. So what I'm going to ask you to do, and this is what I'll leave you with, I'm going to ask you between now and next week to read through that prayer. Do more than read through it. Okay, this is, this is where the big push comes. This will take you a full five minutes. I'd like you to actually take the time to hand write out this prayer. Because there's something that happens when you do that that starts to move it from out here to in here. And as we walk through this prayer, it's going to be my prayer that this transforms how you approach our Heavenly Father in the same way that it has done me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time here. We thank you for the privilege that is ours of opening your word and, and seeing what you have planted. We thank you for the privilege that we have of actually coming to you in this communication that we call prayer. But we ask it over these weeks that you would recraft how we even think about prayer. We thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name.